I graduated from college in 1969 with a bachelor's degree in voice and no marketable skills. I taught that summer drama and poetry at a camp in the woods. I had no teaching skills either, but I found I had a knack for it. A local state school and hospital heard there was a musician living nearby and asked me to come for an interview. So I rode a rickety bus through a rainstorm and then the hospital appeared through the mist like some ominous castle. It was basically a warehouse for 3,000 adults and kids with disabilities. The sights, sounds, and smells were terrifying enough, but when a half-naked patient tried to rip off my hairpiece, I knew I didn't want this job. I was a sensitive musician, but I needed money to go back to graduate school in opera. So reluctantly, I accepted. For the first two weeks, I was allowed to trail the music therapist who was leaving. But after that, I was on my own with no direction or supervision. I walked to the wards with a suitcase of rhythm instruments and a little auto harp. Now I know how Alice felt when she fell down the rabbit hole, I said. But soon, curiosity took over. How could I help these guys using music? With the higher functioning residents, I chose specific songs to bring out their verbal skills, and I used rhythm to help with movement. Several months down the line, I discovered a ward packed with cribs, each one containing a non-toilet trained, non-verbal adult. These folks had lain horizontally their whole lives, and as a result, their muscles had atrophied and drawn up. But I noticed that when I played the auto harp, they shook with excitement. So I got a bunch of bleach bottles and I cut the handles out and I fitted them on their hands. And then I stuck a rhythm stick with bells on it in the handle hole. So now when they shook, they were ringing the bells. I figured if they could learn to voluntarily move their arms, eventually they could learn to move a swivel spoon to their mouth. I had high expectations. I didn't know any better. I'd say, hey, you never know unless you try. Four years later, I'm working at a psychiatric institute in a music therapy department, and I'm telling my supervisor and buddy Nancy, hey, you never know unless you try it. It, this time, refers to a full production of the musical Camelot using the psychiatric patients. I'll adapt the script so that Arthur can narrate much of the action from a podium. We can use the backward patients for the townspeople. We can even make a cardinal out of one of them. The new fellow, James, on the acute ward, I think he has acting experience. He could play Lancelot. And Barb, you know her, she uses a wheelchair. She had polio as a child and she has very low self-esteem. Guinevere would be the perfect part for her. My problem was Arthur. Two Arthurs quit within a week. Then I thought of Dennis. A young resident from the inner city with such acute anxiety that he whispered when he spoke. This would empower him. It's the perfect part for him. I can mic the podium so he can be heard. Dennis quit within a week. What am I gonna do? I got everyone all excited. This is probably the best thing that's ever happened to some of these residents. And besides, the hospital staff is taking bets so we can't pull it off. I'm not beyond bribing someone if it's for their own good. Dennis, I said, if you do this, I'll take you out to a fancy restaurant for a steak dinner and a glass of wine. Dennis considered. Okay, I'm in. Two incredible high school volunteers, some artistic patients, and I made costumes, scenery, even a castle. We rehearsed every day for months. I sent out press releases to the local media and invited all the family members of the cast to come. When the day arrived, we all had opening night jitters. The volunteers were backstage to help. Nancy and I were in the orchestra pit. 
Nancy at the piano, I at the conducting podium, holding my baton in my slightly shaking hand like it was a magic wand. We began the overture, and I took a peek to see who was in the audience. Dennis's whole family had taken a train out to see him. This was possibly the only live stage show they'd ever seen. The overture came to an end. The lights went down and the curtains opened. And Dennis stood behind the podium, dressed as King Arthur with a crown on his head. For several heart-stopping moments, he was speechless. We made eye contact. And then King Arthur began to speak. A week later, I took Dennis out to a fancy restaurant for a steak dinner and a glass of wine. We toasted to happy ever afterings. I'd worked for seven years now, and I had enough money to go back to graduate school. So a month after Camelot, I left. But then I called Nancy a few months later. How's everyone doing? Well, they're fine, Ed. The patient from the chronic ward who was the cardinal, he's still in character. He's strutting around the place, blessing people. And Dennis, how's Dennis? Oh, his folks were so amazed at him. They gave him all kinds of newfound respect. He checked himself out and went home. I was changed too. I realized that my skills were valuable. That job counselor and that hospital staff had been wrong, not just about me, but about the patients, because our skills were different from the majority. My so-called handicapped patients had taught me that we all have abilities and disabilities. It's just part of life, but that's not what defines us. It's how we make use of what we've got that matters.